Well, here we are, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We only have one more chapter in this short little book um, that we will do together, and that will be posted next week, or the week after this one. So I just want to thank you. I want to encourage you to go ahead and just uh, do the rest of this book. And if you've learned anything, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, so that you can teach me what God has taught you throughout the study of First and Second Thessalonians. So, if you are on our um, page, our Sis Facebook page, be sure and leave me a comment. Or if you can, um, you can leave a comment in my messenger box. But I would love to hear you hear from you to to see what you have learned through this course of this study. Before we dive right into 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we'll pray, and then I want to read the first 13 verses, then I want to pause and look at some cross-references, and then we'll finish out the rest of the chapter. There's only four more verses after that, and then I want to look at a few other uh, cross-references. So I hope that you have a pen or pencil or a notebook uh, something that you can put these cross-references in if you don't write in your Bible. Most of us do. And so you might just want to put them right on the, um, in the margins of your Bible. But before we get started on chapter 2, let's go ahead and um, pray and we'll, we'll just jump right in there. Father, thank you so much for this time. And I just thank you, Lord, for this word. And I, I ask God that you would uh, guard my heart and my mind. I want to be a blessing for you, and I want to point others under the sound of my voice to you. I am so unworthy to be leading a Bible study. I don't take it for granted, and you know I don't take it lightly. So God, I just ask that you would have your way in this time change my heart, my mind, change my life through the power of your written word. And God, I pray that you will do the same for the listeners. In Jesus' name, amen. So, let's start with the first 13 verses in Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Now, we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, that you, one, not be quickly shaken from your composure, or two, be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us to the effect of that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one in any way deceive you. That's something we should be praying about. Lord, help me not to be easily deceived. For it will not come unless the apostasy, or um, if you'll look in the margin of your Bible, if you have the New Inductive Study Bible, that means falling away from the faith. So, for it will not come unless the falling away of the faith, the apostasy, comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things? And you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he will be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken where? Out of the way. Then that lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will do what? Will slay with the breath of his mouth, and not only will he slay him with his own breath, but bring to an end by the appearance 
of his coming. That is, the one who's coming is in accord with the activity of Satan with all power and signs and false wonders and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. For this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false. In order that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth, but took pleasure in wickedness. Verse 13. But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in what? In the truth. I hope that you've taken a pencil and that you have colored the phrase, the truth, in verses 10, 12, and 13. That's where we see the truth repeated. That phrase is repeated. Speaking of, I want to pause here at verse 13, and I want to read some scriptures with you. If you want to write these down, you can turn to your Bibles um, if you have the time to do that, or if you just want to keep them in the margin of your Bible for later, uh, a quick reference. But that caught my attention because, of course, it was repeated. The truth, the truth, the truth. We saw it three times in the first 13 verses, in verses 10, 12, and 13. So when it catches my attention, I just want to look up some scriptures um, to see what all that that entails. And so the very first passage of scripture that I want to look at with you is Numbers 23 verse 19. And it says, God is not a man that he would lie, nor a son of man that he would change his mind. As he said, excuse me, has he said and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not make it good? Now, most of us, if not all of us, and I hope that's the case, that it is all of us, we know that God cannot lie. We know that his word is true. But I want to reiterate that because long after I'm gone, maybe someone who doesn't know, who hasn't heard, who doesn't realize, who's never heard that God is true, that his word is true. I want to give you some scriptures that show you that God cannot lie. Now, the, Satan is the father of all lies, but God in him, there is no lie. He's not a man that he would lie. And so for those of us who know that, you're like, okay, well, I already knew this. Not everyone does, and I don't want to take it for granted that just our Bible study group may look at this video at some point long after we're already gone. So that was Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he would lie, nor a son of man that he would change his mind. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not make it good? The next verse that I want to look at is Proverbs 22, verses 19 through 21. So that your trust may be in the Lord, I have taught you today, you indeed. Have I not written to you excellent things of counsels and knowledge to make you know the certainty of the words of truth so that you may correctly answer him? Who sent you? The next passage of scripture is 1 John 2, verses 3 through 5. It says, By this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth, the truth is not in him. 
But whoever follows his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. I would encourage you to go back, read that over. Listen for the Holy Spirit to maybe point out some things. Maybe some places in our hearts and lives that we need to surrender to the Lord. 1 John 5 verses 6 and 7. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not with the water only, but with the water and with the blood. It is the Spirit who testifies because the Spirit is what? The Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify. The next passage of Scripture is Titus chapter 1 verse 2. In the hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie promised long ages ago. And then the last passage of scripture that I'm making reference to in regards to the phrase, the truth, is Hebrews 6, verses 18 and 19. So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to hold firmly to the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul. A hope both sure and reliable and one which enters within the veil. I'm so glad that I have hope, that he is my hope, that I can hold firmly to him who is hope, that anchor of the soul, and a hope both sure and reliable. And I have found him to be those things over my life of nearly almost 60 years. And I'm so thankful for that. When I feel hopeless, I know that I'm not. Because I know him. And I hope that you do too. So I I would encourage you to go back and read those and be encouraged with these scriptures knowing that your God, the one true God, is not a man that he would lie. That he is our hope. We can believe his word. This is God's spoken word. Now, if you'll look back at verse 14... That's where we're going to pick up and we're going to finish these three verses. And then I want to look at maybe three other passages of scripture. Verse 14. It was for this he called you through our gospel that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brethren, stand firm. I don't know if you want to circle that. But I just want to remind you that you and I, because he is the anchor of our soul, we can stand firm in the midst of adversities. So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us, Paul is saying. Verse 16, Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who has loved us and given us, eternal comfort and good hope. There's our word hope again. By grace. Comfort and strengthen your hearts in what? In every good work and word. I want to look at verse 15 again where it says stand firm. So then brethren, stand firm. Let's look at 1 Corinthians Chapter 16, verses 13 and 14. Be on the alert. Stand firm 
in the faith. Act like men, be strong, and let all that you do be done. How? In love. I fall short of that. I want to read those two verses again. They're very powerful. Be on the alert. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. That's reiterating what verse 15 is telling us when it says for us to stand firm. Now look at Ephesians chapter 6 verses 10 through 19. You're familiar with this passage. Some of you may not be. I don't want to take that for granted, so I'm going to read it. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 19. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. His might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God. Why? So that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Then verse 14, stand firm. Therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to, you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And we just read earlier, he, this is the word of God. God is not a man that he would lie. Verse 18, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints and pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. Let's pray for some boldness and let's pray that God will help us to stand firm because we're given his word and that's what we can stand firm on. Now there's one other passage of scripture I want us to look at together. That is the first chapter of Philippians, and it's verses 27 through 30. Now, here's some instruction for us. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Why? So that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm. And one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, in no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you. And that too, from God. For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. Isn't it the most encouraging thing that when you know of someone who is going through such a rough time and they've, they've gone through it in power and in victory because they stood firm. They had hope in the God of this word right here that you and I have the privilege of holding. It's so encouraging, so uplifting to know that despite the trial, despite their difficult circumstances, they never turned away from God, but they stood firm in their faith. 
Now, I read that to you, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, out of the New Inductive Study Bible, the New American Standard Translation. But I want to read this chapter to you um, from the New Living Translation. Now, just listen. Just put your book down, put your, your Bible down, put your pencil down, and let me just read this to you. I was so encouraged by this. Now, dear brothers and sisters, let us clarify some things about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and how we will be gathered to meet him. Don't be so easily shaken or alarmed by those who say that the day of the Lord has already begun. Don't believe them, even if they claim to have had a spiritual vision, a revelation, or a letter supposedly from us. Don't be fooled by what they say, for that day will not come until there is a great rebellion against God and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the one who brings destruction. He will exalt himself and defy everything that people call God and every object of worship. He will even sit in the temple of God, claiming that he himself is God. Don't you remember... Paul says that I told you about all this when I was with you. And you know what is holding him back, for he can be revealed only when his time comes. For this lawlessness is already at work secretly, and it will remain secret until the one who is holding it back steps out of the way. Then the man of lawlessness will be revealed, but the Lord Jesus will slay him with the breath of his mouth and destroy him by the splendor of his coming. This man will come to do the work of Satan with counterfeit power and signs and miracles. He will use every kind of evil deception to fool those on their way to destruction because they refuse to love and accept the truth that would save them. So God will cause them to be greatly deceived and they will believe these lies. Then they will be condemned for enjoying evil rather than believing the truth. Go back and read those passages of Scripture that you and I looked at regarding the truth. Verse 13. As for us, we can't help but thank God for you, dear brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord. I hope that you know that you're so loved by the Lord. We are always thankful that God chose you to be among the first to experience salvation, a salvation that came through the Spirit who makes you holy and through your belief in the truth. He called you to salvation when he told you the good news. Now you can share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. With all these things in mind, dear brothers and sisters, stand firm and keep a strong grip on the teaching we passed on to you both in person and by letter. Now, may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal comfort, aren't you thankful for that eternal comfort that we have, and a wonderful hope, comfort you and strengthen you in every good thing you do and say. I'm going to read those last two verses again. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal comfort and a wonderful hope, comfort you and strengthen you in every good thing you do and say. Let's walk in a manner worthy of the calling of God. Let's behave and walk as children of God. And let's share the truth of God with those who do not know Him. Stand firm. See you next week.